And in a way, what we need to do, to be honest with ourselves, is to write off the ANC as an intellectual and a moral force. Because none of them are present in the ANC. The Zondo Commission has dealt in thousands of pages with the moral case against the ANC. What does the state of ESCOM reveal about the ideological orientation of the ANC government? I posed this question to Songye Zozibi in a recent episode of my podcast, Solutions with David Ansara. If you enjoyed this short extract, you might want to check out the full-length discussion that's linked in the description below. Enjoy. Obviously, there's a lot going on in the political landscape, and we've had now four years of the Ramaphosa administration. He came in with very high hopes. Many people claimed that he was a reformer. Uh, myself and my colleagues were a bit skeptical of that claim. And you know, in many respects, he's shown himself to be very much a status quo kind of leader. Uh, the ANC as a party is also uh, intellectually adrift. Uh, the policies that are on the table are causing enormous damage to the economy and, and society more broadly. So what is your assessment of the incumbent party at the moment? What has caused this, uh, this current situation that we find ourselves in? Well, I'll say two things off the bat. The first is that I never had the optimism that everyone had about our president. Uh, for a variety of reasons, but in particular because of the political institution to which it belongs, and that is the ANC. That leads me to the second point that I want to make. The ANC is not intellectually adrift. It is intellectually bereft. There is nothing there. It's an empty shell. The, the caliber of most of the people who are in cabinet and this national executive committee at the moment would make it at the most at the most basic level of intellectual conversation in the modern age. That is South Africa's fundamental problem. Any expectation that does not, that is not premised on that assessment is going to be, is going to be too high. And we're likely to set ourselves up for disappointment because notwithstanding the fact that you might have a president who has reformist intentions you've got to ask yourself whether his core political institution has got the capability to even know what to reform and how to reform it. That's the first problem. The second problem is whether it has the credibility to convene different sectors of society in order to build national consensus. So what you've heard during the Ramaphosa presidency is that even when he appears to have a little bit of consensus, there is no consensus within the ANC itself because the contestation has never stopped, firstly. And secondly, even when there is, they still can't marshal the intellectual resources within government and the party in order to make those reformist intentions practical. And so we were always going to be caught in this rut. I was never optimistic. And in a way, what we need to do to be honest with ourselves, is to write off the ANC as an intellectual and a moral force. Because none of them are present in the ANC. The Zondo Commission has dealt in thousands of pages with the moral case against the ANC. What we have to ask is whether the task of government since the Ramaphosa presidency demonstrates an ability for the ANC to govern. And I want to argue that things point in the opposite direction. Not only do you and I face the prospect of load shedding while we're having this conversation, municipalities have collapsed. The Auditor General said so. That's got a profound impact on business people and the economy and our ability to give people a better life. And so I'm, I'm not optimistic, actually. I am, I am incredibly realistic about what we're facing now and what we face in the future. If either our president and the ANC are in charge of the country. Yeah, I saw a good graphic illustration of this, which was understanding how the ANC has damaged the energy sector. And the example that was given was that there was like a Venn diagram. So the one circle was uh, ANC corruption. The other was uh, misgovernance and incapacity. And then the final one was ideology. And all three of those circles uh, overlap. Um, I think the ideological orientation of the party is perhaps the most important and influences the other, the, the other buckets. Uh, so if you think of something like uh, state capture, for example, 
the president himself has committed himself to cadre deployment as a key pillar of the ANC's uh, governance strategy. That means that you are going to be putting uh, key personnel in positions in state-owned enterprises or the private sector uh, to enforce a very uh, specific agenda that often leads to these perverse incentives and these corrupt outcomes. Um, so what, in terms, in concrete terms, Songhezo, I mean, what do you think has caused some of these problems? So, I mean, let, let's look at energy. You mentioned load shedding. How did we uh, get into this position? What has gone wrong there at ESCOM? So I want to go back to the ideological uh, problem that you speak about, because the, your ideological, ideological uh, orientation gives you the tools you're going to, with which you're going to frame your task. The ANC continues to aspire to a central planning form of government where the state is the center of development. I think part of the intellectual emptiness of the ANC is that it has not been able to evolve how it understands the task of government or the role of the state. In my view, and what I say in my book is that the state is a catalyzing agent and an intermediator of interests in society, that it becomes a regulator, but primarily it is a catalyzing agent of the entrepreneurial spirit of the people and institutions in the country. So it needs to be an enabler of progress and development rather than the core driver because it doesn't have sufficient resources. It is limited to five-year terms. It has got all of these swings uh, in terms of uh, what it is able to do because of the electoral cycle and intra-party issues, whichever party is in charge. That if you center too much on the ability of the state to function as efficiently as possible, you are inherently going to face a different task. What we need is a state that is a catalyzing agent. Now, what does that mean? That means the state in, the state in its orientation uh, talks about its task in this way, that we need to provide affordable or competitively priced energy to the population whose cost is, is driven down in the longer term in real terms. That's what the government should do. What we have now is a situation where the state is the center, it can't provide enough electricity, and the net cost of energy is going up over time, which affects your economic competitiveness. So you need to change your orientation because it is the difference between having a silly limit on private energy generation and enabling the production of energy generation by as many players as possible, but make sure you've got a set of rules that is clear, that is fair, and that takes account of South Africa's socioeconomic conditions. And that means you've got to not be insecure about losing the role of monopoly in the energy sector, which the ANC is incredibly insecure about. So, it's a different orientation that's part of how the ANC has lost the fight against the availability, the, 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 the reliable availability of energy supply, electricity in particular. Thanks for watching. Let's hand over to you, our audience. What do you think the current state of ESCOM reveals about the ideological orientation of the ANC government? Please leave your thoughts down below. Also, if you enjoyed this conversation, you might want to check out the full-length interview with Songhezo Zibi. That's linked over here. You can also subscribe to my other channel that's linked over here. My name is David Ansara. Until next time, take care.